Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is Pastor David, and you've made it. Yep, you've made it to the end of five weeks of the most difficult passages, most difficult sayings of Jesus. And today, possibly, is the result of obeying those messages. Today is the result of following. If we live the way that Jesus asks us to live, if we obey these difficult teachings, then surely persecution is going to be the result. Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word persecution means to pursue, to press, to choke, and it means to cause great distress. And Jesus begins this particular set of verses, verse 10, saying that a person is blessed. Blessed if they are persecuted. That seems odd on the surface, right? Being, being persecuted, that's not a nice word. We, we don't put that in the a nice word category. And yet, Jesus clearly states that when persecution comes, blessing happens. And, and we're fortunate, right? You and me, we're fortunate because I don't think we really know what persecution is. Persecution is not somebody calling you a, a Bible thumper or a Jesus freak and then giving you a dirty look. Persecution is mistreatment. It involves being oppressed or being restricted. Persecution can involve a fine or prison time. Persecution can be painful and involve suffering and death. Just like our brothers and sisters in Christ who are scattered all over the world, whose lives and whose families are constantly being placed in jeopardy because of their faith in Jesus. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And really up until this point in this series, Jesus has preached some difficult sayings, things that we should all work on, right? We shouldn't be lovers of the world. We shouldn't retaliate. We should turn the other cheek. Daily, we die to self, pick up our cross. We put God first. We walk the narrow way. Then Jesus takes all of those sayings and then he says, guess what? All of those things prepare you for the last thing. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of me. Jesus is preparing us for something. He is giving us an awareness about what it means to be a disciple. But are persecuted people really blessed? I mean, watching it happen, seeing persecution take place in other parts of the world, it really doesn't look like those people live a blessed life, does it? I have a blessed life. I honestly have no idea what this passage really means, do I? I mean, I've been a Christian since I was 10 years old. I've never been in prison for my beliefs. There are no laws that prevent me from worshiping God. I can give a Bible to whomever I want. I, I cannot relate at all to what brothers and sisters around the world are facing. I have not been pursued. I have not been pressed or choked for my faith. I've never been followed or made to feel distressed because I worship Jesus. I am so blessed to have had Christian parents. I am so blessed to be uh, a, a minister and to have had that education. I'm blessed to be able to worship freely in this country. I'm blessed to not have to worry about my family who are also believers. And yet when you think about other parts of the world, it's terrible. Jesus says, no, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For the sake of being righteous, you are persecuted. Which is odd 
or ironic because in the earlier beatitude, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Jesus tells them that if they hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. And now that they are filled, they get persecuted for it. What a, what a dirty trick that Jesus plays on us. How, wh why, why does he do this? Well, it's not a trick. It's just the truth. If you examine the life of a righteous person, you see that persecution is part of being a Christian. As a disciple of Jesus, our identity in him is also one of persecution. Because if we are like our teacher, then we can expect to be persecuted the way he was. In John 15, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. Jesus never says, follow me and do what I did, and then the world is going to think you're great. On the contrary, Jesus promised persecution for his followers. It's a done deal you already know it's gonna happen. So stop thinking that somehow you can overcome persecution. Stop believing that this is somehow going to all get better or that by some miracle, we're just gonna all go back in time to a simpler and a more moral age. It is not going to happen. The persecution that Jesus is talking about means that active hate comes your way. Evil actions are allowed to happen to you. Laws are passed against you. People lie about you in court because you are a follower of Jesus. You are persecuted because you are righteous in an unrighteous world. You are persecuted because you have self-identified as a believer in Christ. Christ is rejected, so are his followers. I actually think that Christians are persecuted for other reasons too, other than what Jesus even lists. You know, Christians can be persecuted because we become known for what we oppose and what we dislike more so than what we love. Christians can be persecuted because we're obnoxious and because we're unnecessarily offensive people and they don't want to be around us. Christians can be persecuted if we get in the way of keeping Jesus Christ at the center of our lives and we live in a different way. If we live a hypocritical life, we will feel criticism. First Peter 4 says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So if persecution is part of being a Christian, how do you handle it? How do you handle it? How are you going to handle this persecution? We already said it's, it's, it isn't going to feel like a blessing, <laughs> right? John Fox was a 16th century English historian, and he's best known for writing a book, Fox's Book of Christian Martyrs. And it gives a very detailed account of the different Christian martyrs throughout Western history. His book is about courageous men, women, and children who have been tortured and killed because of their confession of faith in Jesus Christ. But even more, it's a book about God's amazing grace that enables people to endure persecution. 
and often very horrible, very torturous deaths. You know, under Emperor Nero, Christians were burned alive, fed to animals, beheaded, crucified, scourged, scorched, and subject to every single kind of torture imaginable. Many were women and children. The book looks at the story of Christian martyrdom through the Inquisition and the Reformation, and it tells stories about John Wycliffe, John Huss, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, Archbishop Kramer, and many others. And if we read their stories, they weren't complainers about their persecution. It almost seems like they welcomed it. They embraced it as part of their identity. And then oftentimes they would thank God that they were worthy of persecution. Have you in times of persecution, of doubt and pain, in times where you feel like you are being mistreated, was that the time that you thanked God? Not usually. We typically pray that God would take the pain away, take away the doubt, take away the mistreatment, take away the tormentors, make, make those people move to another part of town. Would you please just make that guy quit his job so I don't have to deal with him anymore? Could you make that family move to another state? Take them out for good. How do we handle persecution? Look at Matthew 5.11 again. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Verse 11 highlights something very important that also happens to be mentioned in verse 10. Because verse 10 says, Persecute, that we are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And verse 11 says persecution comes on my account, and it's Jesus who is speaking. So Jesus is talking about being hated, being mistreated, solely because you are filled with his righteousness and you follow his teachings. Well, Jesus is talking about being held down then and oppressed because you identify with Jesus. Jesus knows that a believer can rub people the wrong way. In some places, it can be against the law. Not because of anything we have done, but because, as John 1.10 says, that Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. The next verse, verse 12, says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How do we handle it? How do we handle persecution? We rejoice, right? We rejoice. Man, that is difficult, right? Isn't that difficult teaching? It is. Verse 12 says there's a reward. And knowing that there is a reward, that shouldn't be the thing that motivates us. Our motivation should still be righteousness for his sake, but it's still nice to know that there's a reward. Jesus says earlier in verse 10, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, which means in context that someone who is persecuted for their faith already has all the benefits of heaven in their life. Jesus says that if that, if that mistreatment comes, if laws are passed against you and pain and death and fines and prison and suffering and hate and evil people lie about you, and it's because you're a believer in Jesus, rejoice. Rejoice because there is an eternal reward waiting for you. The Bible talks about rewards in other places. Matthew 6 says, And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. Luke 6 says, But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Hebrews 11 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I want to tell you a story. A real story about Christians being persecuted in the time of the church after Christ has left. Acts 5 says, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in a public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. 
And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you have intended to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree, and God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you are about to do to these men. For before these days, Thutius rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and that came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan is their undertaking, it, is of, it will fail. But if it is of God you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found to be opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer and dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus Christ had arisen. Here's the amazing thing about this story that I want you to see. Those same disciples who feared death and who feared persecution while Jesus was alive, those disciples that were hiding in the room after Jesus had been killed, they were afraid for their own life. Now, they fear nothing. Now they fear no one. They were jailed. They were told not to preach anymore. But an angel broke them out of jail, told them, don't listen to the officials. Keep doing what you're doing. And they were persecuted because of it. They were physically beaten by synagogue leaders. And how does the story end? With Peter and the other apostles saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? No. God, take this pain away from us. No. God, make these people go away so it's easier for us. No. Verse 14 says, They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer and dishonor for the name. They did not cease teaching or preaching. That's how they handled persecution. The same Peter who denied knowing Jesus is now praising God for being beaten in his name. Can we say the same? I want to follow the disciples' example. I wonder what I would do if soldiers arrived at my house and wanted to confiscate my Bible or <laughs> my, my many Bibles, right? Because I own a lot. I wonder what would have happened if laws were passed against worshiping God and police were outside blocking entrance to the church. I wonder what would happen if the local mayor or the local governor said that they had to read the sermons of all the pastors who preached because they wanted to control the narrative, control what was being said. Just go watch the news and see what's happening 
in other parts of the world. See what's happening to Christians. It's very eye-opening. If you ever wonder why a, a person would risk sharing Jesus when it was illegal, it's because the Bible says there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. If you're ever wondering why a pastor would risk being put in jail or dying for someone they don't even know, it's because Jesus says that we should die daily and pick up our cross and follow. If you're ever wondering why youth groups and churches in America smuggle Bibles into closed countries, it's because the Word of God is living and active and it is the only means of God's message and love and salvation to us. If you're ever wondering why anyone would risk their own happiness, their own joy, their own livelihood, their own families, and yes, their own life for the sake of the gospel, it's because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and there is no other. Let's pray. Lord, right now we just want to pray for Christians and missionaries that are all around the world, that are in places outside of America, that are continuing to preach the gospel in places that are hostile to the gospel. We pray for the lives of missionaries, of pastors, of evangelists, that dare to stand in the street corners the dare to erect churches where it's illegal, for people who dare to bring Bibles into places where it's illegal, for Christians to share their faith when they should be quiet. We pray for courage. We pray for boldness. We pray for encouragement and blessing. Blessed are they. Blessed are they, for they are filled with righteousness' sake. May we be reminded that whatever little persecution we face in America, we should take it in stride. We should be rejoiced that we are considered worthy to be persecuted for your name. May we fear what humans can do to us less and boldly preach and teach your kingdom come. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for coming out and uh, worshiping with us this morning. Of course, I would remind you that we have a church. It is in Walden. It's in the Walden community in Montgomery, and we would love to have you be a part of it. We have a 930 service, which is traditional. We're going to sing hymns out of the hymnal. We have a choir. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to feel exactly like the church where you grew up. And then in the middle, we have our coffee and donuts and a, a fellowship hour. And then we have our second service at 11. It's a little bit more contemporary. We have a worship team. Please come casual, feel, come however you feel the most comfortable and bring your children, bring your family. We've got something for everyone from birth all the way through high school. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week.